And Father, we thank you for this day and all the blessings you provided for us. Now the opportunity to come before you to worship you and to praise you and glorify you and your son, Jesus Christ, especially for his completed work on the cross, for our salvation and the ongoing forgiveness of our sins. And so, Father, we just thank you for all that you've given and provided for our families and for our church. And we ask you to continue to provide for every need in the coming days. We pray this evening for Angelo and ask that you continue to have your hand upon him and his uh, cranial issues, uh, that young uh, six-month-old boy. And we just ask for your loving hand to be upon him and his family according to your will. And also praying for those uh, lost in the submarine out the uh, uh, Atlantic. And we ask that uh, uh, they are found and rescued according to your will and that everyone is safe and uh, we have a good outcome to that according to your will also. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you lead us now as we uh, worship you through the study of your word. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Psalm chapter 22. Let's go to Psalm 22. <coughs> and again, uh, because of our uh, lateness and the hiccups we had with YouTube uh, broadcasting tonight, we're just going to get right into our service. And uh, we continue to understand our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His crucifixion. And uh, we are now focusing on uh, the three hours of darkness that fell upon the land, uh, which probably was the entire earth during this three-hour time period when our sins were being imputed into Jesus Christ and He was being judged for those sins. As Luke says in Luke 23, verse uh, 45, he talks about the two great physical uh, disruptions of planet Earth, the darkening of the sun, and then the earthquake that has the temple veil being torn in two. That's really the bookends between uh, those two uh, great events was our Lord taking on our sins. And so we're going to the other Gospels to focus on what happened during that three-hour time period and really just after that prior to the temple veil being torn in two. So in regard to that, we are noting that Jesus Christ made a cry. The first thing that we're noting, we had an outline on Sunday. I'll share that with you again on Thursday. But Jesus Christ cries out towards the end of the three hours of darkness, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as I pointed out on Sunday, that also is a, a prophecy that is found in the uh, Psalm 22, and specifically in verse 1, where it starts that great psalm of the suffering servant with that exact phrase. So let's go there in our Bible, Psalm 22, and specifically in verse 1. And as it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. So here we understand the suffering servant going through these difficult times of uh, suffering as Jesus Christ was now on the cross having taken on the sins of the entire world and being judged, suffering that spiritual separation from God the Father during that specific time. And at the end, he then makes this cry, and as I said on Sunday, pointing people back to this psalm so they would go to that psalm, reference that psalm, and then you see the other analogies in the first half of that psalm in regard to the crucifixion of our Lord. So Jesus Christ is witnessing the gospel to people as he's making this phrase towards the end of this suffering, but it's also giving us a great understanding of the anguish in which he is currently under. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we also recognize that he makes this cry, he's calling out to God the Father. I'm going to share uh, a little bit more understanding of this uh, cry in just a minute. But what we do what recognize is that this was a cry out to God the Father. We could say it's a prayer to God the Father based on the great agony that he is going through and seeking out the Father for guidance and assistance and help during this time. And what we also recognize from Psalm 22, as we look at verse 24, that our Lord did not forsake him. He actually was there with him the entire time. And you can read it, and I've got it up on the board for those at home as well. In verse 24, it says, For he has not despised nor abhorred the, afflicted, the affliction of the afflicted. And again, that's talking about Jesus Christ and our sins being poured out onto him. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. 
And that's a great lesson that we all need to take away, that when we cry out for the help of God, our Father, He hears our prayers and He answers our prayers, as we know, according to His will. And as Jesus Christ was now upon the cross, taking on the sins of the entire world, that was the will and plan of God the Father from eternity past. Jesus Christ willingly took on that plan. He willingly understood the suffering that he would be enduring at this point in time in the payment of the penalty for our sins. And with joy, he now was at that cross taking on those things, even though it brought great pain, suffering, and loss to him physically during this time period. So there we recognize the cry of the cross is one of, of faith in God, not one of unbelief. When he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We absolutely know that Jesus Christ recognized everything that was going on. He knew that this was going to happen. He prophesied that this was going to happen. He wasn't in a place of stupor. He wasn't in a place of confusion or perplexity. He wasn't in a place of despair either. It wasn't a, a cry of, I don't know what's going on. Help me, Lord, okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? was a witness so that we would recognize what was happening at this point in time. God the Father had to voluntarily separate from the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the hum I should say the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ because remember in deity they are inseparably one. But from the humanity, he had to turn his back. He had to have that separation physically and spiritually during this time. Because our sins were now in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God cannot have a relationship with that sin. Therefore, he need to have a separation from him. He need to have this time of darkness within his soul. And remember, the darkness fell over the land, an outward figure of what's happening within his soul. His soul became sin. The darkness of our sin was in his soul, not of uh, any accord of his own. Now he was experiencing that sin. Darkness was inside of him, which meant God the Father was separated from him as well. So the darkness of God's light was not there during this point in time. So again, he was not confused. He was not unbelieving. He was not perplexed. He ultimately was recognizing what was going on and said the words so that we could understand that he had this separation from the Father at this point in time according to prophecy as he was paying the penalty for our sins. And so therefore, he never doubted once that God the Father would abandon him. We also have the verses, and I'll show you them today in a little bit on, I've showed you some already. He would not abandon his soul to S.H.I.E.L.D. He would not abandon his soul to Hades. He knew that he would not be abandoned. He had the Word of God. He had Bible doctrine resonant within his soul. He was operating through the power and the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. He recognized what was happening, and he was saying the Word so we would understand, and we too would have the opportunity, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious leaders of his day, would recognize what he actually was doing. Because we understand and recognize that Jesus Christ was a willing participant in the plan of God the Father. And he submitted to that plan throughout his entire life. There was a never a moment during his life where he was outside the will and plan of God the Father. And he knew the plan that was to arrive at the cross, to take on the sins of the world, and to suffer this spiritual death and that separation from the Father because of the sin that now was in him. Not sin of his own, but the sin of every member of the human race. And throughout this entire ordeal, he was absolutely confident in the will and plan of God the Father to get him through this process and to get him onto the other side. Because we also know in his prophecy that he made himself. He will raise on the third day. He will be seated at the right hand of God the Father. All things will be placed in subjection under his feet, which means he would have authority over all things. He had absolute confidence of the plan and will of God the Father, but he was screaming in this physical agony so that we could understand what he actually was enduring. 
and he ex- and he understood what this abandonment was all about and he was going through it as a faithful soldier of God the Father. So Jesus Christ cries on the cross was one of physical agony, spiritual anguish as well, and also this relational alienation, separation from God the Father. As our sins were imputed unto him, pointing back to the great passage of Psalm 22, uh, verse 1, and then throughout, so that we could understand the experience that he was going through as he was winning salvation for all of mankind. He absolutely knew what was going on. That's why we read in John chapter 10 and verse 17 through 18, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Jesus Christ is in absolute authority as God in hypostatic union, as 100% man as well, but in 100% authority to lay down his life. And we're going to see when we get to the death scene of our Lord, He doesn't have his life taken from him. He breathed his last breath, and he refused to inhale. He gave his life at that point in time. He took his own life, as it were, as God, as deity. So again, for this reason, I lay down my life, and he laid it down. But before he laid it down physically, he laid it down spiritually by taking on our sins and being a willing participant for the judgment for the penalty of our sins in his own person. So I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. In the resurrection of Jesus, when we get there, all three members are involved in the resurrection of Jesus. And he is the one that raised the body back to life as the Father brought the Spirit back into the body and the Holy Spirit brought the soul back into that body. We'll talk about that in detail later on. Jesus Christ then raised the body and brought it back to life so that I may take it up again. Now in verse 18, No one is taking it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So very interesting how Jesus Christ in this one passage talks about his hypostatic union. You see, no member of the human race has authority over their physical body to take their own life. No one does. Even those that commit suicide have no authority to take their own life. You see, God has decided that day. Even if they take the action to take their own life, it's still God's will and plan, 100%. Again, God uses all kinds of tools and means and modes of operations to take our life when he says so. But it's not taken until the day that God says so. So for Jesus Christ to say on the day in which he's going to die and to take it himself, again, this is not suicide, so don't get into that, because it's not the humanity of Jesus Christ that's making this decision. It's the deity of Jesus Christ that is making this decision. So that's the first part of the hypostatic union. The second part of the hypostatic union, this command I received from my Father. So now you see the humanity of Jesus Christ being in one in hypostatic union. Again, even a willful participant to the plan of God the Father. So whether it be his deity or his humanity, Again, he has placed himself under subjection while he has been here on planet Earth to fulfill the will and plan of God the Father. And even in the eternal state, he has placed himself under subjection, even from his deity, to be called the Son. You know, why is he taking on that lesser role of being the Son? Why didn't he take on the role of being the Father? Because he willfully chose to do that. It's kind of interesting, you know, remember this little, this little uh, 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 bit of knowledge and information, this little bit of wisdom. When you humble yourself to subject yourself to whatever authority is over you, you are never belittling yourself. You see, that's what we're all afraid of in this life. Oh, I can't humble myself. I can't place myself in subjection under somebody else's authority because that will belittle me. You see, Satan does not want you to have that mental attitude. Satan wants you to have the attitude as, I am in authority. I have all authority. I am in charge. I am this. I am that. 
And when we have that mental attitude, we're having the attitude of what? Satan. I will be like the Most High. I'll raise my throne above the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the clouds. I, I, I. And he wants us to think that way so that we never come to the place of humble submission to authority within our lives, whatever it may be. And if we can't humbly submit to the various levels of authority authority in our earthly life how are we going to submit to the authority of god you see a lot of christians think oh i submit to the authority of god do you when you don't submit to the humblest authority on this earth if you can't do that you certainly aren't doing that and when you don't do that you aren't doing that why because god tells us to be humble and submit to the governing authorities in our responsibility or in our world. And what's that responsibility, first and foremost? The Word of God, Bible doctrine. And then I know a lot of people, as we studied uh, and saw the verses, don't forsake or don't abandon the gathering together of yourself. You see, there's a lot of people, I don't need a right pastor teacher. I don't have a right pastor. The Bible doesn't teach a right pastor teacher. I don't need a pastor teacher. I'm just going to do my own thing. Just going to go here, just going to go there. I'm not going to submit. And why don't they? Because they want to be in charge of their soul. They want to be in charge of what doctrine they're taking in. They want to be in charge of what they learn and what they don't learn. And they want to, you know, cherry pick what they like and what they don't like. They don't want to submit to the authority of God under the investment of a pastor teacher that is duly has authority invested by God over the congregation to teach them the word of God that they need to hear. They don't want it. They want their own thing. And those that I'm looking at in the face today, you're not in this crowd, okay? Those online who are faithfully here, you're not in this crowd because you're here listening. But there's people that come, they go, they come, they go. And why? They don't want to submit to authority. Why? Because they'll be a lesser believer or a lesser human being or whatever the case may be. You know what? You're the greatest human being when you submit to the authorities that God has placed over you. That's when you're the greatest. When I am weak, then I am strong. Not when I am strong, I am strong. Okay? No, it doesn't say that. When I am weak, then I am strong. And when are we weak? When we are submitting to uh, the authority of others in our lives, as God has duly noted. And again, I say the faces in the audience and the faces of, of you at home as well. I can't tell you how many times, you know, you know, e e every week somebody's coming up to me, and usually it's more than one. I can't believe you just taught on that because I've been thinking about it all week, or I've been thinking about that today, and you taught on that verse, or you gave me that information, or you taught on this, or you answered that prayer, or you gave me this. You see, the people that aren't submitting and the people who don't have humility, they don't receive that. They don't get that blessing. They don't get the answered prayers from God that they otherwise should. But when we humble ourselves, we get that and we receive it. Jesus Christ humbled himself to become a being that he created. Again, I always like to use, you know, the cockroaches, okay? You know, we're like a cockroach in compared to God. But you know what? It ain't even that. Because we can't create a cockroach. See, we don't, the separation between a cockroach and us is in the animal kingdom, okay? But we can't create a cockroach, so we can't even make that comparison between what Jesus did to become one of his created beings. Just imagine that. Just imagine that. It's even less than the relationship of that, an ant to a human or whatever the case, however you want, whatever insect you like to use, okay? We can't even compare, but Jesus did it. And when he became weak, then he became strong. And now he's glorified for all of eternity. Just as you can be glorified for all of eternity when you humble yourself to receive the duly vested governing authorities that God has placed over you, starting with his word, second, with his church, and the pastor teacher that he has given to you. Again, I can't make, it's like, you know, you, can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, okay? I can't make people come. I can only give the information, and it's between them and God because we all have free will volition. 
Jesus Christ had free will volition. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father, and I am doing my Father's will. So we see the deity and the authority that he has to raise himself and to take his life. We see the humanity. He's humbling himself in all to be in the will and plan of God the Father for our benefit and for his benefit as well. So throughout this, we see the hypostatic union of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and specifically regarding the doctrine of kenosis. And what's that? He did not use his deified functions to solve his own problems. He did use his deified functions while he's here on planet Earth. So to say he emptied himself, as it's translated in uh, Philippians 2, 7 and 8, as it's tra- he emptied himself, or no, he didn't empty himself. He didn't lose his deified functions. He just didn't use them all the time. He relied on the Holy Spirit. And we've pointed that out. Again, we've talked about that a lot. Right here we see that as well. You see, he's on the cross. He's under agony. He's going through severe pain and suffering, now being separated from the Father. So much so, he cries out for the first time. A a, a lamb silent before his shearers up to this point. Now he cries out. Why? Because it was real suffering and real pain. And he easily could have avoided that through his deified powers. Jesus, when we talked about it, Jesus, take yourself off the cross. If you are the Christ, save yourself, and us too. We saw it three times, right? The three temptations. Appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride. He said, no, I'm not going to use my deified function. I'm going to rely on the will and plan of God the Father, and I'm going to trust in the Word and the filling of the Holy Spirit. The great divine power that God has given to him and has given to us during the church age as well. That is what I'm going to rely upon. That's what I'm going to submit to. Hmm? That's what I'm going to submit to. The Word of God and the leading ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's what he did. He could have got himself out of this jam. He could have got away from this agony, but he did not. And he wanted to go through this suffering because he knew that it would pay the penalty for our sins. And then anyone who would believe upon him would have eternal life. Their sins would be forgiven And they would not have eternal condemnation that is deserved because of their sin. So he willfully submitted to the plan of God the Father. And he took on this pain and agony and suffering. And therefore he cries out in spiritual agony, in spiritual suffer and anguish. As he took on this judicial spirit, I'll say it this way because I like to say the word, judicial substitutionary, I love that word, spiritual sacrifice the substitutionary spiritual sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he experienced the substitutionary spiritual death, separation from God the Father during this time. And as he did it, we also can't forget the love of God, the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ and how he had you in mind. And so therefore we see the impersonal, unconditional love that he was able to experience and able to apply in God's power system, as I like to call it, God's GPS. You know, we have GPSs today. It leads us. It tells us where to go and what direction we should be heading in, left, right, up, down, backwards, forwards, whatever the case. That's what the Word of God, coupled with the power of the Holy Spirit, does as well. It gives us our direction in the spiritual life. And with that direction, he had love within his soul, that wasn't based on how good or bad we are. Because again, I'll speak for myself. If he looked at my life, he'd say, I'm not dying for that guy. He's got all kinds of sin. Why would I die for that guy? Oh, he doesn't talk to me every day. Or he insulted me 10 years ago. Or whatever the case. Oh, he doesn't do everything I ask him to do. Oh boy, I'm really throwing myself under the bus here, aren't I? All right. All right. I'm a bad Christian. All right. But in any case, you know, he knows us and he knows our sin and he knows our human good and our humanity. And there is nothing lovable about our sin and our human good works and our evil. There's nothing lovable about that. That's why impersonal, unconditional love 
is that great love that he demonstrated, that he experienced this agony, this suffering. He went through that hardship because he loved us so much that he knew the benefit that would come for his endurance of that hardship. And again, think about your life. Think about all of our lives. How much hardship do you want to endure? Well, in the United States of America these days, we don't want any hardship. We want everything comfy and cozy. We want everything just right. We don't want hardship at all. Hardship? What's that? And boy, if any one of us got thrown back, you know, 100, 150 years, 200 years ago, never mind 1,000 years ago, and you try to live that hardship, yeah, you'd be like, no, Mr. Wizard, get me out of here. Take me home. No, I'm going to throw Steve under the bus right now, Deacon Steve. I'm going to throw him under the bus. He, he used to always love, oh, I'd love to live back in the Daniel Boone days. You know, I love Daniel Boone and Opie and the Mayflower, not the Mayflower, Mayfield or whatever it is. I want to live in those times. Oh, that'd be great times. And it does look good, wonderful. But then he watched The Revenant. You ever see that movie, The Revenant? Okay. Guy gets attacked by a bear. They're out in the woods. They're dirty. He goes, I don't want to live in those days. <laughs> I don't want to live in those days. Okay. It's hardship. Okay. We get it, okay? We get, yeah, those are other shows, they don't show you all that stuff, okay? You know? But we get it, okay? But in any case, I'm just trying to make the point. We live in easy times. And the heartache and the suffering, again, th stuff that the world has always endured. The world has always endured and is going to continue in to endure until our Lord destroys the heavens and the earth and creates anew. Even the millennial reign is going to be heartache and suffering and difficulty in perfect environment of our Lord. So therefore, we always need to be applying impersonal, unconditional love towards our fellow mankind to motivate us to go forward each and every day and utilize the great power system that God has given to us, His Word and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. It's the only way to endure the only way to go through the suffering and the anguish for the benefit of other people. And that's what it's really all about, and to the glory of God. And that's what Jesus did, for the benefit of all members of the human race and to the glory of God. He endured it. So we have humility and we have love. And with those two aces in your pocket, you can endure all things and now you can go out and do because now you get the word you get the filling of god the holy spirit you've got the greatest power that the world would ever see and so what happened during these three hours that our lord was in darkness on the earth our sins were being imputed to him he was taking them on one after one after one i'm going to show you some math on thursday okay didn't have time to get the math in for tonight but i'm going to show you some math on thursday and even after I do the math, okay, when I say do the math of the number of sins that Jesus Christ probably took on and paid for, okay, each individually, I'm looking at that number. It's a huge number, okay? It's probably not big enough. It's probably not big enough, all right? It's probably big enough for one person's sin throughout their life. We'll see, okay? I'll show you the numbers on Thursday. But in any case, our sins were placed in Him, imputed to Him. He was judged for them by the Father. We know that. And it resulted in the sentence of a separation, which was tremendous agony. And it happened during three hours. And again, you know, we say three hours. Oh, any, anybody, if you, you know, if you build yourself up enough, you can endure anything for three hours. You know, you can do it. Okay? But again, time and eternity, from a deified standpoint, Again, three hours human time, we don't know. We have no idea what that meant in God time, okay? We don't know. But I'm sure it was a lot more than what we would think of a three-hour time period, okay? So in any case, it happened over a three-hour time period. It took place during this three-hour time period, but that's when he suffered greatly. So in regard to this, now we have to understand what does it mean to have our sins imputed into the Lord Jesus Christ and for him to receive those sins. So we're going to get into, you know, a, the doctrine of the imputation of our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and cover some points, and I'm giving you more in your notes than what I'm going to actually, you know, uh, mention in total, but the, the whole doctrine of uh, imputation is in view, okay? Because it's really about imputations that why Jesus Christ is now in darkness for three hours. 
first the imputations that we receive from day one of our physical birth, and then uh, the imputation that Jesus Christ received on our behalf now 2,000 years ago. So that's what we're going to get into tonight, and I should be able to wrap this up on Thursday, but I always say that and I never do. But uh, hopefully uh, you can hold me to it this time. All right, but in any case, imputation is defined, okay? If you don't know what imputation means, okay? Defined is something that is reckoned to somebody else, okay? I'm going back to the old Opie days. Pa, I reckon, pa. Remember those? I reckon, pa. I reckon, pa. Okay? What does that mean? He's taking on something. He's taking on some knowledge and some information, okay? Reckoned, okay? Where something is given to you or put on your account. Something's attributed to you or ascribed to you, okay? Now, the ascribing is more of a name, you know, title, uh, you know, giving kind of thing. But, again, imputation has to do with that as well, something that they have received. When Jesus Christ took on our sins, they were ascribed to him. And in a sense, he was seen as a sinner in God's eyes. But not of his own, but our sins, because he took them on. And then we have the charge to one's account. He had no sin of his own, but he took on the sins of the entire world. When we talk about imputation, it's used as an act of God, whereby either he can bless us or he has to condemn us. In both cases, the judgment of God, which means his righteousness and justice, are in view. So anytime God is you know, wanting to impute something to us or to anyone, his righteousness and justice are involved, and it's either for blessing or condemnation. And when I say condemnation, uh, it can be eternal condemnation, but also we could add in that divine discipline. We talked already about the darkness coming and the wrath of God being poured out onto Jesus Christ. He was condemned, as it were, because he took on our sins. So the wrath of God came down on him, which means the justice and righteousness of God came down on him. And in this case, he had to bring a judgment against him, a form of condemnation. Just as the unbeliever who doesn't accept Jesus Christ and his perfect work on the cross to take away their sins, a judgment will eventually come against them that has already been uh, laid against Satan and his fallen angels a condemnation to the eternal lake of fire. But on the other hand, if we are accepting the things of God and our Lord Jesus Christ and walking in his will and plan each and every day, God can judge us and bless us, both in time and eternity. And again, a lot of times we think blessings materialistic things, but you know, sometimes a blessing is just having a moment. <laughs> just having a moment of peace and calm and quiet. It can be a great blessing. But again, blessings come in many different forms, shapes, and sizes, and God knows what we need at every point in time and what he is able to justly and righteously give us at any point in time. So we have blessings for time. We have blessings from eternity. Those are all part of the imputations that God is able to uh, uh, you know, give to us or impute to us, I should say. So this is all a function, as I've already noted, uh, of the justice of God directed towards and related to his plan for mankind. You know, sometimes God would like to bless you in a certain realm, but because he knows that blessing would, you know, uh, interrupt his plan for your life, he doesn't do that thing. Like, let me win the lottery, please. Okay, let me just win the lottery. Okay, but he knows if I win the lottery, my life will be destroyed. <laughs> okay, especially me. <laughs> right, and when I say life would be destroyed, not from a humanistic viewpoint, but from a divine and eternal viewpoint, I wouldn't walk in the will and plan. I'd go astray. I'd, you know, be all, uh, you know, caught up in the material things. 
Or even if I maybe could handle the material things, I'd be all caught up in the administration and the affairs and people on my door knocking. I, I need a buck. I need two bucks. I need three bucks. I need four bucks, whatever the case. And I would be distracted from my walk with God. So again, there are many things God would love to bless us with, but he knows that that would not be the best thing for us as well. And that's the sovereignty of God we have to keep in mind. And in this case, the sovereignty of God knew that the best thing to bless the entire world would be to have his son judged and have the imputation of our sins into him. And that would be the greatest blessing of all time. So when we talk about imputation, we're always focused on the integrity of God, his righteousness and justice, his sovereignty and his love all working together. You see, the love of God would want to just bless, 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 bless. That's what we're going to get in the eternal state, okay? When he can do that, because everything's perfect, right? And no sin. But in time, he can't just love, 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 okay? And just bless, 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 bless. He can love, 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 but he has to withhold sometimes. And sometimes he has to discipline. Just as a loving parent needs to discipline their wayward children. And if they don't, they're going to stay wayward. <laughs> okay? So they have to discipline. So in any case, you know, God, in the imputation of our sins to Jesus Christ, knew what would be best for mankind and best for Jesus in the long run as well. Because as Jesus Christ would endure this, now he could be uh, exalted to glory. Not just as God, but now in humanity as well. So the integrity of God is absolutely involved. From a doctrinal standpoint, we see there are three factors in imputation. And first is the source, which is God himself. He's the one that brings about these imputations. Okay, He's the source of what we see in regard to the plan and will of God. Number two is that the nature of the imputation, which means what is being imputed, is the imputation a blessing or is it a condemnation? Okay. And again, shades of variation all in between. So what's the nature of the imputation? That's always in view, and God's always thinking about that. What, what is this thing that I'm imputing, and what's the result of it? And then number three, the recipient of the imputation. Who's receiving this and why? And who's the specific human being? Now, we're focused on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, so he's the human being involved, and he's the recipient of this imputation. All right? So again, we have the source, the nature, and then the recipient of the imputation. Then we see two categories of imputation. And the first one is what we call a real imputation in a, from a theological standpoint. So real imputations, what does that mean? It means the justice of God imputes something under the principle, and again, get some highfalutin words here, antecedent and affinity. Okay? And I'll let, you let, let that marinate for a little while, then I'll give you the... You know, my street talk next, okay? I'm going to give you the street talk next, all right? So the real imputation. You know, what's the justice of God? What's he doing? There's an antecedent. In other words, there's something that can receive that, and the thing that is able to receive that, it goes together, okay? There's an affinity. The two go together. So in real imputations, you have person receiving the imputation and the thing being imputed and they have to go together and they do go together and there's a commonality between the two as it were all right let's get street talk maybe we can understand a little better so in other words the two things go together naturally okay so naturally this isn't something that is forced this isn't something that uh, is diametrically opposed it naturally goes together. In other words, there's harmony between the two things, agreement between the two things. 
of what's being imputed and the target of who's receiving the imputation. All right, so I need you to understand all these things so that we can understand what Jesus Christ is actually experiencing and why. What's the importance of him taking on our sins? And then secondly, we see the judicial imputations. So those are the two categories. The first one's a real imputation where there's affinity and harmony. Two things go together. You could say they walk hand in hand, another way of saying that. But now you have the judicial imputation, which is where the justice of God says something is going to be given to something else. They don't go hand in hand. There's not that harmony and affinity between the two. One doesn't go along with the other, but yet the imputation is going to happen. Okay? So this we could almost say they are diametrically opposed, but yet God is going to take something and impute it to someplace else, or take something and impute it to somebody else. And in this case, he took our sins and he gave them to Jesus who had no sin of his own and was an absolute, completely perfect human being, holy and righteous, and had nothing to do and had no affinity and no precedence for receiving our sins. There was nothing he did that deserved any of this. And there was nothing about him that said, if you take these things on, oh, they'll all just go, you know, hand in hand, merrily down the street. So that's why we understand the judicial imputation. The two things do not go together naturally, yet they are made to go together by God for a specific reason. It's kind of interesting and when we talk about our Lord Jesus Christ, and in your notes I gave you a little bit more detail here. Again, nothing about our sin went hand in hand with Jesus Christ. And there was nothing in him that said, I should take these on in his person and in his nature. Nothing. But God made it go there in judgment. The same happens when we become saved. There's nothing in us as an unsaved person that deserves our salvation and eternal life and the righteousness and justice that God gives to us and all the blessings that go along with it. There's nothing in us that deserves that. But yet God gives it to us according to his will and plan. All right? So in the plan of God, again, there are two judicial imputations that's why there's only a few, because they don't go hand in hand. And God doesn't want to do a lot of forcing here. But yet there are five real imputations that happen that do go hand in hand. Okay? And I'll just read those to you quickly, because I don't have them on the board. What I do have on the board is the focus on our Lord Jesus Christ. But the two judicial imputations are our sins being imputed to the person of Jesus Christ when on the cross. And that is a judicial imputation. There's nothing about Jesus that goes hand in hand with our sin. He was perfect and holy and righteous. And then secondly, the perfect righteousness of God given to the believer at the point of salvation. So again, those are the two judicial imputations. and only two in God's plan and in God's word. Our sins to Jesus. And then when we believe in Jesus, perfect righteousness of God into the sinful body that we're living in. All right, and that's it, just those two. But you see how it goes to Jesus first, and then it comes back to us. And we too get to receive a judicial imputation because we have believed in Jesus Christ. Now that we believe in Jesus Christ, and we have that righteousness of God in our soul, now God can do all kinds of things for us that have a home to receive it, called His perfect righteousness. So the other imputations that God gives to the believer now have an affinity in a home in a good way. But you see, the first real imputations that God gives to the members of the human race is in the bad way. Because 
Well, the very first thing, and you get this in your notes, and I'll just go through this quickly, is that God imputes human life to the physical body that comes forth from the womb. He breathes the breath of Nashama, like he did with Adam and the woman. He breathed into their soul, and he gives them physical life. Okay? At that very same time, he also imputes to that body Adam's original sin because there's a home to receive that sin called the old sin nature. Remember how Adam's sin nature is passed down through the male from generation to generation to generation. And because that baby comes forward and already has in its genetic makeup, we would say DNA, the sin nature, someday God in heaven is going to say, you see that DNA gene right there? That's the sin nature. He's going to show us that. Because this, the human body has the sin nature, it can receive Adam's original sin. It can receive that imputation because it goes hand in hand. The sin nature from Adam and his original sin. And as a result of that, we then die spiritually at the very moment that we are born. Then, later on in our life, the believer accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now he can impute eternal life to that individual and, and, and give them a human spirit and the perfect righteousness of God. All right? And because the perfect righteousness of God is a judicial imputation, now we can give that individual a human spirit and he can make that person a righteous individual. Where now we are righteous, even though we still sin. God looks at us from a perfectly righteous standpoint. So we have no sin, even though we do have sin, because there's a nature in you that is absolutely perfect called your human spirit that has the righteousness of God in it. Now he can bless us in time and then also in eternity by giving us a resurrection body and ultimately uh, leading us on into the eternal state. So the real imputation of physical birth includes the imputation of human life to the newborn baby, Adam's original sin, and these things simultaneously occur. So when he breathes physical life, he also imputes Adam's original sin, the baby becomes physically alive, but then spiritually dead, all instantaneously. And again, this goes back to the analogy, Adam and the woman only had one thing they could not do in the Garden of Eden. And if they did that one thing, they would die spiritually and lose their righteousness. Only one thing they couldn't do, and they did that one thing. Now God's flipped the switch, or flipped the script, I wanted to say. Flip the script. Now, okay, we are brought into this world spiritually dead, and there's one thing we need to do to have spiritual life. Only one thing. Believe in Jesus Christ. We don't have to do a bunch of works. We don't have to go to church. We don't have to be good people. We don't have to do this. We don't have to do that. We should be all those things, and that's a result of being saved. We become those things and do those things. But the thing is, the one thing, believe in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. So they did one thing, and they would lose their spiritual life. We do one thing, and we gain our spiritual life. Which would you rather have? I'd rather have be what we have now. I'd rather do the one thing for spiritual life than do one thing to lose my spiritual life. Because we do a lot of things throughout our life that deserve to lose our spiritual life. Yet we don't, because we've done the one thing. All right? So because of these, every baby is born alive soulishly, but then dies spiritually. And they're brought into this world spiritually dead. And that's very important because, as I said, there's one thing they need to do. And the reason they're able to do that one thing is because what Jesus did 2,000 years ago by having our sins imputed onto him. And now when that baby at some point believes within their lives, when they get old enough and can understand the gospel, okay, prior to that, if they die, they go directly to heaven, as you know. But if they do that one thing, God then imputes to them the perfect righteousness, a human spirit, and eternal life. So, let me wrap it up with this this evening, and then we'll come back on Thursday. There are three categories of spiritual death in regard to human beings. 
The first one was Adam and the woman. And we've talked about that. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God said, do not eat that fruit of any tree in the garden you can eat, but not that one. Satan came along, you know, did his sweet talk, led them into sinning and, and rebelling and rejecting God's will and plan for their life. And as a result, they died spiritually. And we've talked about that. They received the darkness within their soul. They were naked uh, physically. Now they became naked spiritually. Jesus Christ was naked physically on the cross. He then became naked spiritually, just like they did. And the darkness came within his soul, the separation from God the Father. So that, that first spiritual death occurred in the Garden of Eden. They were spiritual alive. They died spiritually. But as you know, Jesus Christ taught them the way of salvation, and they received it, and they became spiritually alive once again. But then number two, again, is that uh, member of the human race, or I should say all members of the human race, they die spiritually at the moment of our physical birth from women. Okay? And based on the real imputation of Adam's original sin to the genetically formed sin nature that is in them, they die spiritually. There's a home to catch that. You know, God's like throwing a fastball of Adam's original sin. There's a home to catch it called the old sin nature. And it goes together. And because that sin now is in the body of that baby, spiritual death occurs even though physical life happens at the same time. And they remain that way until they believe in Jesus. And then finally is the spiritual death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. The third main category of spiritual death in the human race. First Adam and the woman, then all members of the human race upon their physical birth, and then Jesus Christ, because he came into the world like Adam and Eve, spiritually alive, absolute 100% holy, but he took on our sins willingly, had no sin of his own like Adam and the woman, but took on our sins, and as a result, had to suffer that spiritual death. And what we note in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrated his love towards us, his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And again, a substitutionary spiritual death. A substitute should be in italics there. But again, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And based on the imputation of our sins into the person of Jesus Christ, he suffered the penalty so that anyone who would believe upon him would have eternal life. And for Jesus to do that, he needed to humble himself. He needed to have that love of God. He needed to have that impersonal, unconditional love for all of mankind. And he needed to be empowered by the word of God and the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And because he did all of those things upon the cross, now he won the victory over sin and Satan and death. And so now we can all have spiritual life. All right, so that's a good introduction to the imputation of our sins to Jesus. We'll come back and talk even more about that and the great work that he accomplished on the cross during the three hours of darkness. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for helping us to understand the doctrine that uh, Jesus Christ uh, took on and endured so that we could to totally understand your great mechanics for our spiritual life and also to understand that all will be without excuse. Nobody can say they did not have an opportunity or it was an unfair and an unjust process when they are thrown in the lake of fire because they did not believe. You have done everything for us and provided everything for us, and now you've left it up to us to simply believe. So, Father, we pray for all of the unbelievers in our periphery and in our world, and we ask that the gospel continue to resonate within their souls so that they too can come to salvation. And we thank you, Father, for the great salvation you have given us through the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ. So we pray for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.